to part two of three uh, lectures on um, Freud's totem and taboo. Um, okay, so we're going to begin now. We're just going to jump into um, chapter one. I'm going to show you an image. This is where we're going with this, okay? So, so in many ways, this first chapter is just sort of a ground-clearing chapter, but he's going to introduce that interrelationship between totems and taboos between the collective representation of society and the laws of the society. So, so in 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 essence, the totem then, he's so we're, here's where we're going. He's going to introduce the totem as the uh, the thing to which the society imagines itself to owe honor and respect. Okay, and. And if they do that, if they honor and worship the totem, then it will generate something like a protective force field around them, protecting them from evil, other enemies, whatever it might be. The exchange, in exchange for doing that, they also have to uh, obey the laws of the totem, the rules of the totem. So one of the laws is don't kill the totem. Don't eat it. Don't kill it. And actually, I'm just going to put this in there. It's the commandment to worship and feed and love the totem, right? Worship, feed, and love. And then, um, and then no, don't enjoy, don't touch, don't touch uh, the totem's women, right? So, so the rules that are set up, there are things that can't be touched. You know, in many ways, you know, Freud is a, um, you know, was Jewish in in in, um, in background. His last book that he wrote was about was Moses and Monotheism, which was a a really um, again speculative but fascinating analysis of uh, ancient Judaism. And uh, so, so if you think about, you know, the the uh, in Genesis in the Old Testament, uh, the first book of Genesis, right? Um, where there is a thing that's set aside, right? You get a God, and the God uh, gives you a garden and then says, whatever you do, don't touch, right? Don't touch that apple, whatever you do, or whatever it was, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't touch it, right? You touch that thing, it's all over with. You know, punishment will come. Well, don't touch. That turns out to be what's really there. So, so his claim is going to be that there's a conscious taboo, right? And we need to figure out now that if it's a, if what why does the totem why does society have the totem uh, um, tell you not to touch a specific thing? Uh, is it because that thing isn't wanted anyway, or is it because there's a lot of desire for that thing? And I think you know where Freud is going to go with this. Okay, so um, all right, so let's kind of walk through this really quickly. I'm going to use my notes uh, as opposed to walking carefully through the text. But again, just to show, I, I'm using, um, you know, the Norton text, uh, Totem and Taboo. Um, you know, it's got the Gay introduction, Peter Gay's introduction, um, translator's notes. Uh, yeah. Hebrew translation. Yeah, there it is. So, so, you know, throughout the book, in fact, each chapter is structured so that he layers three populations. Um, uh, yeah. Three populations or three categories are are um, all analyzed um, as manifesting a certain structure of symptoms. Okay, and um, and so basically he's claiming that these three categories do not quite get to a kind of normal homo normalis, to use the phrase that. Uh, that uh, Wilhelm Reich used, right? The normal modern human being. We don't quite get there, which is also, by the way, neurotic, even though he's using it for a different reason. Let's just not worry about the modern character. So they don't. So these three categories of people aren't quite adult modern people. Uh, savages or primitive people, children who haven't quite gone through all the developmental stages where they would arrive at an adult uh, position. They're not fully socially born yet. And then character disordered or mentally ill people, right? And in each chapter, he's going to tell us, look, there's a, uh, you know, children are going to probably manifest uh, uh, elements of this. Not all of them, but he often does. There's going to be a particular kind of uh, a personality disorder or particular form of mental illness that's going to manifest the traits that he's looking at. And then he's going to look at primitive people that are as well. 
right? So he's going to say that the fully modern person has probably found a way to handle all of these things, but um, uh, but that um, other categories don't. So again, I'm going to kind of just be walking through this as we go, um, trying to point out some key things. So again, uh, you know, again, he's going to view the horror of incest and the universal strength of incest taboos in psychoanalytic terms. Uh, the strength of the taboos, he claims, this is the key finding of this chapter, strength of the taboos is a sign of reflection of the strong repressed desire for the thing prohibited. In other words, you wouldn't say no to something that wasn't uh, a strong desire. Okay? In other words, we don't have a single society that is that has as the number one taboo, the number one law, thou shalt not um, you know, eat terribly tasting things, or thou shalt not um, sleep on the ground without any comfort or any pleasure of any kind. You know, it, it, you, th thou shalt avoid. Uh, um, <laughs> you, you, yeah, th thou shalt avoid all suffering or something like that. I don't know what it'd be, but anyway, you, you wouldn't prohibit something that isn't that isn't desired. So he's going to claim that if if you're prohibiting incest. Um, it's going to be because there's a strong desire for that. And if you're going to be prohibiting killing and eating the totem, it's going to be that there's a strong desire for that as well. Okay, so that's where he's headed with this. So again, there's a correspondence between the mental life of primitives or savages and children and mental, mentally ill people. So page two, he analyzes or begins to describe what a totem is. He's using some of this sort of 19th century anthropology to do it. Uh, it's usually an animal, uh, common ancestor, right? That we're all of us who are members of the rabbit totem have a rabbit as the ancestor. That rabbit is our guardian or spirit helper uh, we're pro that protects the tribe. As long as we don't kill it or eat it, right? We're going to benefit from it, right? Uh, if we don't do this, right? So we have a kind of contract almost, set up a quasi-contract. Um, the totem is collective. It's not, we're not like, we're not Roger Rabbit. It's all rabbits, right? The entire species of rabbit is our totem. So we have a collective ancestor or an ancestor that, that inhabits all things rabbit, right? So we're not just, you know, it isn't, um, again, it, it, it's not just a specific rabbit that did something really nice for us. It's all rabbits as a species, okay, as a category. And then number five, the ritual life of the group is centered upon representing and enacting the behavior of the totem and as well as punishing those who violate the rules of the totem. So the totem then is the center of social life. That's what it is, actually. So there's there are no other things. Anything like it, like like other forms of tribal or clan association that would be separate from this are overridden. They don't exist. Any SIB or biological organization doesn't exist, right? It doesn't really matter. That this is what society is. If you're in a totemic society, society is the society of totems. Okay? And so what is a society in this sense? It's a group of people who come together to honor and worship a particular totem, who feel themselves to be an ancestor of that totem, who feel protected by it, who agree to take uh, you know, care of it, and, and so on, and to uh, you know, have a ritual life surrounding it. All right? Okay. Everywhere there's totems, there's going to be taboos, and everywhere, and that includes sexual restrictions, okay? And, uh, and marriage restrictions based upon those who share a totem. So totems are always going to be exogamous. So, so wherever you have totemism, you're going to have exogamy. You can't marry within your totem. So you always have to have two, right? Always have to have two. Um, all right. So totemism then and exogamy are linked to it. So that means that how do you bar... Uh, uh, marriage with inside of a totem, you have to have an incest taboo, right? Thou shalt not touch the women of the totem. That's the great no, first taboo, the incest taboo. All right, the punishment of, a ta of such a taboo uh, is, isn't left to just the spirits or automatism, although that often happens, but the group often enacts vengeance, energetic vengeance that bonds the group together to get rid of people who violate it. That's how you purify the group after there's been this violation. The ultimate sacrilege uh, uh, of, you know, violation of the totem are often dealt with by death, uh, you know, and so on. Okay. Um, the totem isn't linked to offspring or children. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. In other words, even if you don't have children in the totem, uh, if you have just any contact with, uh, with the women. So it, that means it's not fully biological. This is his point through all of this. Biological incest winds up not actually barred in a totemic society. Totems are are not hereditary, right? Um, they're not, uh, yeah, excuse me, they're hereditary in the sense that you're born into one and they're not changed by marriage 
And often, like among these tribal peoples, it's where you were walking is where the totem came from. So the biological mother and the father can be from a different totem as the child, which means that um, virtually no biological incest is, pre is, is uh, prevented. So it's a purely social attribution. The totem is a purely social attribution, and that means that the that the taboo against um, uh, against contact within the totem is also something that is purely social. It has nothing to do with biological, uh, 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 you know, uh, reproduction. Um, all right, so there it is. So, uh, and again, there's an excess quality to it, right? There are many, 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 many more people who are barred from sexual uh, um, contact than would be necessary by any purely biological means. It, it just goes crazy. Like he says, you wind up with something like, you know, three-fourths of all women in your group uh, uh, a bard, right? So the great whore of incest, and he says that's what this is. That's what structures this group. It is the whore of incest and the punishment of it. And and again, the, the, the women exchange, the ceremonies of exchange, the way that birth, death, um, uh, initiation takes place, the way that, the, that marriage rituals take place, the way that... Um, uh, pregnancy rituals take place and so on is all structured by the totem. So everything is about the totem. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, yeah, so this is a, so that, so the totem father is a social, not a physical relationship. Um, again, there's an excessive quality to it. Page seven. Um, all right. We'll just go with that. Page uh, 10. Yeah, primitive societies then are uh, support the incept taboo with huge cultural cu cultural customs. So uh, Freud's going to make a, 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 a shift here about page 10 where he stops analyzing actual bar uh, barrier against incest to talk about the spread of it out into ultra other cultural forms. And he, talk he, he talks about the, the mother-in-law uh, prohibition. So really, even in societies that have a strong... Uh, 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 sibling, uh, sister, or um, um, brother, sister, and mother, son, uh, uh, barrier, father, daughter, barrier. Um, there are categories that wind up growing, right? So, uh, and again, he says uh, tribal sisters are sometimes included, although there's often sacred orgies that take place where, you know, again, totemic uh, sisters of the totem can wind up being uh, sexually approached during orgies and stuff, so he says that's kind of important. But he claims that the biggest one, this is page 12, the, 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 the form of avoidance that's biggest is the, uh, is the prohibition against um, mother-in-laws, um, which I find uh, kind of interesting um, and not particularly um, believable to me for some reason. But he says that's it. So why such a strong avoidance taboo with a woman uh, the same age as the actual mother. Well, if you know anything about psychoanalysis, then he goes into this discussion about this, that 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 his analysis of patients, he often finds that there's, uh, on the part of men, a desire for mothers, and on the part of women, a desire for fathers. That that has to do with that early, um, that at the moment of the psychological birth of the human individual, that you're just a little kid, a little child, and that the people who are closest to you, the adults who are closest to you, that you're bonding with, that you're, you're imprinting with, are a mother and a father. And so at the moment of the psychological birth of the individual, these people had a big imprint on you and that that, that has to get broken at some point. So the social birth of the human individual is often uh, about breaking that bond. But it leaves behind a residue, right? So like we said earlier, the things that are repressed return. So even though you are effectively repressing uh, 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 you know, desire for mothers and, and, and other relatives, uh, there's it can return in other forms. So the incest, uh, the avoidance taboo against a mother-in-law, Freud argues, is actually a mechanism of of um, of continuing. Um, it's an excess quality of of, of of the incest taboo itself, right? And what it does is it again, like like it like you get the initial, you want something, it gets repressed back, and then it rebounds and it finds an opening, a culturally created opening right and then it finds its way out there so that's the return of the repressed and that's transference and displacement 
So you might initially have a desire for the mother is what he's saying and to return to the mother, stay connected to the mother, not necessarily sexually, but you know, you know, to stay in the mother feeding you, mother clothing you, mother taking care of you, that kind of thing that's blocked and barred. And so then they, so then you're going to want to go to the mother instead. And so that here culture creates a second uh, avoidance ritual to keep you from going through this opening. So that's going to drive you to another opening. What's the obvious opening? Well, the other opening is obviously to the socially sanctioned wife, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, so then there's all kinds of stuff about this that goes on. So I, I'm not very uh, taken with this, but the point of it is, let's sort of get to it. Let's get to my drawing again. What he argues is, again, that what the mother-in-law avoidance rituals show is that um, is that there's a totem, and the totem is essentially a kind of uh, social father of some kind, and that social ba father bars contact with uh, the women of the totem. And that be and, and so and what Freud is doing, th this essay is all about getting across the idea that there is a strong desire in the real that corresponds to uh, taboos. Okay? That's his claim. So let me find my picture from before. So this is really important, okay? Again, if society is going to grab a hold of you, it has to have an energy source and it has to have a lever. And his argument is going to be that, that the most powerful way for a society to get a hold of you is to force you to give up your strongest desires. And so if you're a little kid and you're socially born and all that kind of stuff, you don't want to leave your family. You don't want to leave your family of origin. You want to stay around that which is familiar and that is what is providing you comfort. And his argument is going to be that that's not what you're going to want to give up. So the way that a society grabs hold of an individual is to bar them from the thing they most want. For one thing, that proves that the society is really strong, that the totem is really strong, right? If it has the power to remove you from the thing you most want, and then it's going to provide substitutes, um, a job in the contemporary world or a, a socially sanctioned uh, a partner of some kind, right? So that's what happens. So it is your strongest biological drive, right, that gets expressed out into the world and the direction of that drive, where it gets directed, is going to be controlled by totems and taboos. And the totem, you're going to worship the totem, and then you're going to obey the taboo. And that taboo is going to tell you where you are going to be socially allowed to direct your fantasies, your drives, and your desires, right? So as Freud, uh, as Lacan says about Freud in the uh, four, uh, uh, you know, the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis, he said that, look, what this is, what psychoanalysis is all about is helping us understand how the real, our reality, is how we cope with the real of our lives through the symbolic order, through society. How does society shape the way that we experience and cope with the real, the reality of our life, okay? So that's the big ar argument here that, that, okay, so you get into these situations, you have the basic totem taboo structure, and that the way that the totem proves its power over you, makes real, realizes that power, is to force you to abandon, to give up that which you most want. So his argument is, is that the incest taboo, in the totem sense, that you must give up the women of the totem, in fact, you must give up three-fourths of all of the women of the people around you, um, means that you, that you, this, he claims that's your strongest desire, and that by forcing you to give that up, right, um, that's going to do something to you. It's going to repress, and you're going to have all that energy. And that energy, we don't have anywhere to go with yet, but just get that idea. It's that repression, that shutting down, right? That shutting down of desire is where you're going to get this energy, right? The energy that would have gone out in a drive is being blocked. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. So you've got this drive that can't go where it wants to, so that energy is there. So we now need to know where it goes, okay? And that's where it goes in chapter two. So what is chapter one all about? It's all, so I mean, it's amazing. In like 15 or 20 pages, Freud basically tells us where the energy that makes society comes from. His answer, the energy that makes society comes from the repression of drive and desire. It comes from the clamping down of human wants, right? Society tells you no. So where does the energy that makes society comes from? 
It comes from the no, from the fact that you've been blocked from doing what you want. And that energy that would have been expended, right, in the release of the of the drive is now held. It's a tension that's there that can then be used to fuel something else. And that's what chapter two is about. So chapter two then is called Taboo and Emotional Ambivalence. So in this essay, he views the emotional and behavioral aspects of primitive taboos in psychoanalytic terms. He, li- he likens uh, modern obsessive neurotics, right? Uh, obsessive, obsessive compulsives, like people have OCD, who exhibit traits we now call yeah, obsessive compulsive disorder are seen as exhibiting very similar behaviors as primitive peoples, okay? So um, this is where we're going with this. I'll just sort of highlight it, and then we can speed through it later. Okay, so we've got that energy. So last time we learned that what taboos do is they choke down, they block energy, all right? So you want to do something, and you've been told no. So that energy is there. Well, that energy has to go somewhere, and he claims it goes into building society. So here's where we have to get to. We have to figure out how the energy in our, um, uh, that we project out into the world, right? The real of our drive gets projected out into the world. And the structure of that projection is determined by totem and taboo. So we want to project positive energy onto the totem, and we want to put negative energy out to the objects of the taboo. So we want to view the mother-in-laws as untouchable, mothers as untouchable, the daughters as untouchable, if reverse the genders, uh, uh, gender however you like. But the idea is, is that we have to um, put positive valence, value, positive feelings on to the totem and negative feelings onto the objects of taboo so that we don't go after them and approach them, okay? So there has to be some way then for this energy that's been blocked, right, gets out. And the argument is going to be projection is the way that it gets out. So we're blocked by taboo from doing what we want. So we have all this desire that was going to go to the tabooed object. It's now blocked. So it comes out. So where does it go? Instead of going that direction, it goes the opposite. It gets flipped over in valence like projectors do. Camera lenses do that, right? Camera lenses actually invert the thing that they're either projecting out or that they're taking in. So a projector lens inverts, so they actually have to do a kind of inversion of the inversion, and a camera lens, the old-fashioned uh, camera lens, inverts too. So, so wherever that moment of repression is, wherever the structure of repression, the structure of the unconscious is, that that thing doesn't just dictate the location of the lens of projection, but it also is going to ensure the, the inversion, the flipping around of the valence of the thing projected. So what does that mean? So you're blocked from doing what you want. So you have this desire, this positive feeling for the taboo. And now you can't have it. So it gets reversed back as avoidance or hate against the taboo right? I don't want that. And then as he's going to talk about in this chapter, it's also going to be reinverted back as vengeance and hatred towards anybody who pursues the objects that you've given up. So you don't just hate the tabooed objects or the tabooed acts. You also hate with incredible vehemence those who violate taboo. And he argues it's because if they, if they do, if they violate it, it's going to trigger desire and envy on the part of those who are chomping uh, to do the thing that they're doing. So you get an inversion of valence. You start out with a positive feeling towards the tabooed object, but but the law of taboo forces it around and it becomes negative. On the other hand, the thing that just told you no, the totem that just told you no, you don't want to obey. So you hate that thing. But that also gets turned around and gets inverted into love and reverence for the totem. So the energy that's blocked, the positive energy that's blocked, that was supposed to be discharged in the drive towards the tabooed objects, gets inverted and split. It gets, the positive gets displaced from the original object of adoration, the tabooed object, 
and it gets placed onto the totem. The negative valence, the hate that you feel towards the totem, gets transferred or displaced and inverted onto um, the tabooed object. Okay, so that what this means is is that consciously, un well, let's go this because you're in a totem and taboo structure of society, your unconscious desire for the tabooed object is transformed into hate. And, and especially hatred of those who go after it anyway. And your hatred, your unconscious hatred for the thing that told you no and that prevented you from getting what you wanted gets transformed consciously into love and reverence. So you get, again, between the unconscious and the conscience is a little portal, a little place where there's a lens. And that's that lens of projection. And that's where the drives and images come out and are projected outward. And, and that's what, so the energy for projection, the energy that makes society comes from this, this repressive apparatus. And it also locates where the projective lens is and then it ensures the inversion, the reversal of the valence towards the thing it was originally intended to, so that the thing you initially desired to love, you hate, and the thing you initially desired to hate, you love, and then it displaces the original love and hate onto different objects. You get that, you get what he calls displacement or transference, okay? So again, we get all four of those um, fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis that we uh, talked about um, at the beginning of last lecture, we get them all, right? We get uh, the unconscious, we get repetition, because the things that are repressed come back with a vengeance, the, rever the return of the repressed. We get the transference or the displacement of the things that were um, repressed. as they re So they repeat, but they repeat in a different way, in a different direction, with a different valence, with a different object. And the drive is the energy source that fuels the whole system, both the individual psyche and the social self, as well as society itself, is all fueled by the apparatus of drive. That's all it is. That's all society is, is simply a, um, I mean, let's use Marx's term. It's simply externalized social jelly. That's what it is, right? It's, it's, it's social energy, human energy, that has died into the honoring and worshiping of a totem object, right? Where's our other picture here? The first picture. Um, yeah, that it was died that died into the honoring and worshiping of a total of a totem object. And um, yeah. yeah, it died into the honoring and worshiping of a total ob totem object, and it also then spends itself into into this energetic avoidance of tabooed objects, as well as the energetic punishment of those who violate the taboo, right? As those who commit a sacrilege. Okay, so that's where this whole thing goes. So, so society then is a structure of totem and taboo. The totem is the thing that tells you no and that receives your positive valence. And the taboo dictates what you hate and avoid. And that's where the negative valence goes. The more you're blocked and repressed by the totem, from achieving the things you want, the more energy that's available, not just for hating the thing you're told to avoid, but for loving the totem itself. In other words, the, the social energy that is directed onto the love, honor, worship, feeding, uh, you know, sacraments that, that, that honor and revere the totem, that energy comes from the repression of drive. Okay, And it is only if society represses key drives, the things people want most, does it generate sufficient power to fuel the honoring and the worship of the collective representation of the society, the totem itself. So the more repression, the more energy available for ritual life and for uh, you know, punishment of deviance. In other words, the society is held together more strongly, the more it represses. That's, the ba that's Freud's argument here, right? So the more that the basic drive structure is fussed around with, the more it's, it's repressed and then inverted, and then its objects transferred or displaced. The more it does that, the more powerful it is. And that's what, so society is simply a system of totem and taboo that does that, okay? All right, so he goes through a, a discussion of this. So uh, once repressed, yeah, the crucial idea here is ambivalence, which we haven't talked about yet. 
the repression of one disturbing pole of ambivalent emotion and desire that once repressed, this emotion or desire causes anxiety and unconscious dread that's negated and discharged through compulsive actions, private rituals. The unconscious repressed emotions or desires that are projected onto totems, demonic totems uh, in particular, and the power of totems and taboo ultimately derive from repressed desires. The greater the desire that's repressed, the greater the psychic energy that's required to negate it, the more powerful the compulsive action, which means the more powerful the totem. So there it is. So what is um, so what is society? Society is built of the energy that um, that that was repressed by the laws of society itself, and the energy for ritual activity, the compulsive energy to honor the to honor the totem and to punish the violators of taboo and to avoid the taboo. The more right, that energy comes from uh, from the repressed. Um, uh, drives okay all right so he talks about taboo initially is uh means two things it means holy dread um it's both sacred and forbidden it's both good and bad right um all right taboo is linked to punishment it's sometimes automatic again ta taboo sickness but generally it's punished through expiation right uh uh, uh, a piacular move, getting rid of it, making the, making us a uh, clean, pious again, right? Vengeance, violation of taboo makes the offender himself taboo, right? So taboo spreads. So again, you don't just hate the tabooed object, but you hate those who do it, and it sort of has a contagion. Because it has a contagion, you've got to purify. So many of the rituals in the totem and taboo system are about purification rituals, right? Punishment and purification. All right. Um, and the source of taboo ultimately then is, is magic, power, or mana. And we know from Durkheim that magic, power, and mana is simply raw social energy. Okay. Social jelly, as, as, uh, Freud, uh, as uh, Marx called it. Taboo is not reasonable or justified. It just is. People don't explain why. Um, okay. And then what is taboo? All kinds of stuff. Again, the animals that are your totem you can't eat and kill. Persons get tabooed. People are going undergoing initiation. Women who are having you know their periods or who are having babies, uh, newborn babies, sick people, the dead, anybody who's liminal, who's somewhere between life and death. Right? They're the people who tend to be taboo, especially the dead. So he goes on all this stuff about how the dead. You avoid the dead. You avoid speaking of them. You avoid using their name. Because if you use their name, right, you conjure them basically, right? The spirit of the dead will come forth if you conjure them by speaking their name. So people will actually change the names of the dead uh, in order to avoid uh, conjuring them, that kind of thing. So the belief is that the dead have basically become pure spirit. They become a demon or an angel, generally a demon. And so you engage in all kinds of avoidance of the dead to prevent them from coming back and nailing you, or killing you, or haunting you. This is basically what a vampire is. Vampires in lore were generally close relatives who came back in vengeance against those who refused to kill um, their killer, right? So the belief, Freud writes about this, right? That there was this belief that there are no natural deaths, no quiet graves, right? They're all unnatural. And that you, as a member of a totem, have an obligation to avenge the death of anyone uh, who dies. And if you don't do it, they're going to haunt you, right? They're a vampire coming back to life. Okay. Then he talks about, you know, Freud and, and people have OCD or, or, you know, taboo sickness, basically, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. They often don't know why they do what they do. They almost always have a touching phobia. They don't want to touch something, right? And if they do something, then they get all of these compulsive uh, counter rituals, all these rituals of washing, right? The washers, the sniffers, that kind of stuff, right? Um, right. It's, so, and then there's a liability to displace it. The phobia gets displaced from one to another. Freud writes about that, about how this woman had a phobia of a friend of hers whose last name happened to be the same name as a street. Her husband bought something expensive uh, on that street and she wouldn't allow him to bring it into the house. He had to get rid of it because it was taboo because the name of her friend she didn't like anymore was the same name as the street on which that thing was bought. So taboo, um, you know, that, that kind of dark negative mana, uh, the impure, the sacred impurity spreads, right, like a contagion. All right, so then there's a transference of the prohibition. Um, so yeah, I just talked about that. Okay, 
So then there's all kinds of ceremonial acts or little individual rituals that people have OCD engage in, you know, touching, um, uh, checking rituals, but washing rituals, you know, is a really big one. Okay, page 29, he talks about ambivalence. Um, okay, so he claims that in general, the key, um, yeah, here it is. So repression must include not only repression of the desire, but also the pressure of the memory of repression itself. All conscious memory links are removed into the unconscious. That's part of the reason why repression takes more with it than just the single act. This is something that Bessel van der Kolk writes about in his books, you know, that that uh, people, for example, who have had a traumatic experience in childhood won't just lose memory of that one uh, event. They'll often lose, again, kind of like the associational links to the event. So they can lose years of memory. And, and they simply can't remember large blocks of their life. So one of the ways that analysts know or, you know, that that uh, that psychotherapists know that someone's been through one of these events is because there are no memories, like large blocks of memories gone. So it's removed from the unconscious. That's what repression does. It doesn't just repress the thing that, that it wants to repress, the content, but it represses all these other associations as well. So it has an excessive quality about it, right? All right, uh, so the persistence of the taboo was fueled by the persistence of the prohibited desire. Okay, so he says deep ambivalence is at the core of taboos. Okay, so um, so let's talk about ambivalence really fast here. So that's what this little image is trying to show. So ambivalence literally means um, by, mean, you know, means to, right, uh, or split, and valence. Uh, so we've already had val, means value, right? Val, death, or human life. So bivalent. So let's say there's a positive and a negative value to something, or that you feel positive towards things. Valence, feeling positive and negative. So the positive we'll call love, the negative we'll call hate, right? So when you're ambivalent towards something, you both love and hate at the same time. You're, it's bivalent, both feelings at the same time. Now, this is different from indifference. If you're indifferent, you feel neither positive or negative. You're just indifferent, right? But ambivalence can give the appearance, the surface appearance of being indifferent because you often have a match of love and hate. So, um, so like I often tell this to my students, right? Like if you have a car, an old car, and you put the brakes on somewhat hard and then put the accelerator pedal down very hard, the car might take off. And the way that you can keep the car from moving is to keep putting pressure on the brake pedal as you're putting increasing pressure on the gas pedal, right? And you'll know what will happen to a car if you do this. The car will start vibrating and it'll roar. There'll be lots of energy going. But to an external observer, there might not seem to be anything, right? They might It might seem the car shut off. So like to an external observer, a car that's parked and shut off is indifferent and a car that is being with the engine roaring with the brakes on at the same time right where it won't move they look the same neither are moving but one is vibrating with energy ambivalence while the other one is dead it's indifferent right okay freud is going to tell us that all social things totems and taboos generate ambivalence all of them do every time if you're in society and you're, there are things that have value, things you love and things you hate, or put it this way, things society tells you you should love or hate, right? You're always going to be ambivalent towards those things to lesser or greater degrees. So what is society then? Well, society is a set of rules. And if you're really ambivalent about everything, if you're, like, if you're really like a car with both the accelerator pedal and the brake pedal on at the same time, all that society is is simply a system that tells you and tells the other people around you which of the two, the brake or the gas, is applicable, consciously applicable to the thing that you're aiming at, right? So in the world that we're looking at here, the tabooed object, the brake, you're vibrating, but it's that brake has to be strong. You cannot let it up, right? However, for the totem, you have to let up the brake, right? Because you have to give gas and go towards it and give it energy, right? That kind of thing. So so the totem or the thing you have to keep the brake on hard, but you're going to be vibrating because you really want that thing, right? 
On the other hand, the totem is the thing you have to love with gas, but you also hate it, right? And so you're ambivalent all the time. So society is a system for managing emotional ambivalence, right? Which is going to be omnipresent in social life. Again, if you're in society, you have ambivalence. If there are things that society tells you you should love, you're also going to hate it. If the things that society tells you you should hate, you're going to love it. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that you split conscious, unconscious. Society tells you consciously what you're going to love and hate. You go through the process of the social birth of the human being through initiation rituals in which the rules and the law of the totem are going to be uh, implanted. As you go through, you know, the members of your totem are literally going to hold you down. They're going to cut an orifice in you, and the spirit of the totem is going to get in you. And from that moment on, you and the totem are one. You're going to love that totem. So you're in. And so you're going to use your energy primarily to love that totem and to punish those who violate the laws of the totem, and you yourself are going to do it. However, you hate that bloody totem because that totem is stopping you from doing what you want to do, but you can't express that. And so that block of hate flips over and gets turned into love, and the love that you had for the objects that you wanted to have that the totem says you can't have gets flipped over and turned into hate. So you get a shift of valence, you get an inversion of valence, and you get displacement, right? slash transference, right? So the drive that you felt towards the totem, excuse me, the drive that you felt towards the, so this is the way it works, right? So you felt initial drive towards a taboo object, but the totem tells you, no, you can't have it, right? So then that energy goes back and then it turns into negative energy. You don't want the to taboo, and now you want the totem, but you hate the bloody totem because the totem told you no, that comes back. And that, that actually winds up fueling then the hatred of those who block the totem. So it's this energy system. It's kind of a, all kinds of mirrors and all kinds of things going on, little underground uh, passages and so on, uh, little portals for, for energy to flow back and forth that controls, again, the direction, the aim of your drive, as well as the valence of your drive. Do you love or hate? And where, what's the object? Okay. So then, then Freud goes on and he talks about, you know, about uh, enemies that we have. Uh, so, so, so after he gets all the taboo stuff talks about, then he talks about specific rituals that we use uh, towards um, enemies, uh, include those that we hunt uh, towards people, including the rulers. And I think that's the most important section in this is where he talks about, um, let me try to get this out here for you. Yeah. Yeah, so, so he talks about, yeah, uh, the treatment of enemies is on uh, page 46, uh, where it's the enemy honor rituals, right? And he goes on about that, how we tr try to appease them. He talks about, again, this is where the belief in ghosts and demons come from. He talks about Shakespeare's Richard III and Macbeth, both of, which, both of which have those dream sequences in them towards the end, where the ghosts of the dead come back to avenge or to push other people to avenge, kind of like to stiffen the spine of those who are going to avenge their death and to weaken the resolve of those who did the damage, right? So, so that belief in that, again, it's part of that inversion. Like the thing, you know, you, 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 uh, you want to prevent that from happening, getting haunted. You know, it's in Hamlet too, right? Where you're haunted by the ghost of the father who wants you to avenge his death, right? And so you're, you're um, um, yeah. So anyway, so that's talked about in there. Um, and then the t deference rituals towards rulers. Incredible discussion about that. Um, yeah. And uh, so I'll just kind of I'll just kind of leave that there. You can read it yourself. But it, it just really he basically argues. You know, we always hate these bastards. They're telling us what we can't do. We hate them, but we have to honor them. And yet they're they're really powerful, and we fear them, but we have to honor them, but we hate them. And so he writes about all of these rituals and. Um, uh, compulsion. So, so, so if a king fails to live up to what they're supposed to live, they can be deposed. There's all these rules about what has to happen to a king, like like on initiation day, they get to be beaten, <laughs> that kind of thing, or uh, or they wind up suffocated by the rules that hold them to the throne, that kind of thing. Um, at any rate, there's all kinds of stuff there about our hatred of those who tell us no. And, that, and, 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 and yet, what is he telling us? And this is what's crucial. That the more you're told no, the more you're screwed with, the more that your flow of energy into love and life is messed with, the stronger the energy available 
for rituals of destruction and hate and sadism towards the tabooed objects and actions and those who violate them. And the stronger the energy towards the masochistic bowing down before the ruler. Okay? So the stronger the ruler and the greater the prohibitions imposed by the ruler, the more you're forced to give up what you want, the more you're not getting what you want, right? The more energy is available for inversion and displacement. So you invert the hate into love for the totem, for the ruler, masochistically bowing down before the very thing that's depriving you of what you want, and then directing, again, inverting and displacing your love for life in hatred against those who get what you originally wanted. So you consciously love a ruler, a leader, who's depriving you of freedom and life and love and objects that you want. And the more they deprive you, the more the energy is available for you to explicitly show reverence. And then the greater that that, that, that repression takes place and the greater the energy that's available for a going after and sadistically attacking those. So again, who... so. So uh, let's take in Hitler's case, um, deprives people of freedom, deprives people of, of, uh, of, of shops, uh, deprives people of, of, uh, of democracy, deprives people of, of, of autonomy, deprives people of sort of a, um, honestly, a life worth leading. And most people would hate that, right? And, and tells you, right? You must worship me. You must get on board with the Nazi regime. Back to Eric Amon, right? Here's what you must do. You must, from here on out, do what I tell you and obey the regime. And in fact, I am not just your ruler. I'm God. And when you pray to God, you're going to actually pray to me, right? So that we're going to actually replace the Apostles' Creed with this bizarre substitute that says you're going to worship and honor me. Right? So what do you do with the hate? People must have hated Hitler. So what do you do with that hate? We know he never really had a voting majority. Most of the population wanted to vote him out. They didn't, he, he had a very a relatively small base of support. So what do, they, what, what do they do with the hate towards him? Well, he gives them a place to put the hate. So you, get, you displace your hate that you would feel towards the Nazis, towards Hitler, and instead you displace it towards the object of hate that they tell you to. So there's the tabooed things to do um, is to violate the racial consciousness, right? This Aryan racial consciousness that he's talking about. Um, violating that, violating the honor and worship of the uh, Aryan way. Um, and so they give you an enemy. They give you the people that are taboo, Jews were taboo, and they are engaging in taboo activities. And so you hate that activity and you hate those people. And so the hate that was should have been, that was being generated by the Nazi regime itself gets inverted and displaced onto its enemies, right? So there's a lesson here. So at times when, um, you know, um, I, I don't know... It, it, if times are good, if people are actually having their needs met, you know, in Marx's terms, if you're living in an age where the realm of freedom is great and the realm of necessity is small, um, there isn't a lot of energy going to be flowing into sadistic attack upon enemies and a lot of energy flowing into the reverential uh, masochistic worship of some um, ruler who uses hairspray or something, right? Instead, you're going to be living life, right? And you're going to detune. So politics is going to get detuned. Repressive law is going to get detuned. Destructiveness is going to get detuned. Authoritarianism is going to get detuned. So you're going to be living in a world that's primarily dominated by um, a relatively unrepressed unrep flow of energy into activity that you self-choose and love, Right? And so the, the, the kind of absolute rules of love and hate and so on are, are going to be, there's going to be fewer of them, which means there's going to be less energy for fueling the love of the ruler, love of the king, uh, love of the emperor, the god emperor, 
uh, the unitary sovereign or the unitary executive. Um, instead, you're going to be expecting that those who are in positions of power follow rules themselves, are held bound by rules, and are doing uh, a service uh, to the society of that meets human needs, that accomplishes human flourishing. So what Freud tells us is, if you want to build an authoritarian society, you clamp down on people, and you tell them no, and you begin to deprive people of liberty, and you deprive them of what they want, and you tell them no, and you give them an energy to hate, and, and excuse me, an enemy to hate. And the more that people aren't getting what they want, the more that they're part of a repressive religious regime or part of a repressive political regime that's blocking them from getting what they want, the more energy is available for loving and honoring that regime, bowing down before it in masochistic submission, and the more energy that's available for loving, excuse me, for hating their enemies and for going after them. So societies then, these, these, these early societies, are systems of totem and taboo, people to love, people to hate, right? You are to love the ruler because the ruler, tell, because the ruler protects you, right? So you have to love them. But you also hate them, but you can't express that hate. The stronger they are, the less you can express it. And so that hate thing gets directed back onto the tabooed objects, the tabooed activities, and then especially against those you know, who violate the taboos. So repressive regimes, those that block you from realizing your desire, those that clamp down upon the things you most want, right, are the regimes that wind up having the most social energy and the social power. Okay, so that's a dark vision of what society is. And, um, and, and I'm not saying I completely agree with it, but I think it's very powerful and very important. And these first two chapters lay it out. Now, the next two chapters develop this a little bit. And then again, that last chapter is really long. And it's where he develops the myth of the death of the primal father, in which he really develops this into a, a kind of full-blown theory of, of, uh, of repressive society. Okay? All right. I hope you found this useful. So that's Totem and Taboo, chapters 1 and 2. Uh, there'll be more next week. Take care.